of that song is my wife and I would sing it periodically in our pastoral ministry in different places. Yeah. We were asked to go and sing special music and that was often one of them that we yeah. Thank you, okay. <clears throat> <laughs> I better move forward a little bit. Uh oh, my bad, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I didn't, well, I did, but I didn't realize it was there. I was gonna move forward just a little bit and then. Okay, you can move, wherever you want. No, no, that's fine. It was more of an illustration than a necessity. So I really love that song because my wife and I, in our pastoral ministry, we would be invited to different churches to sing, and often that was one of the songs we sang together. And so thank you, wherever you're seated, thank you very much for singing. I really appreciate that. I love that song. That song means a lot to me. Well, we're going to pray, and then we're going to talk about a message called Jonah, complete in Christ. It's not a question. It's a statement. Amen. Jonah, complete in Christ. Okay, let's pray. Mm. Our Father, we are thankful that you've given us this opportunity to be here together. We give you praise that you have called us to understand a little bit more as a result of being together. We have heard some really powerful messages from your word. Thank you. You're raising people up to proclaim messages such as I love. I just am so thankful for the stuff that we've heard. Thank you for the fellowship that we've had. Thank you for the blessings of coming together and knowing that you are in our midst. We plead for your spirit. We beg of you to help us to understand a little bit more tonight. Thank you for Jonah. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And bless us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. I'm looking for that tissue box because I can already tell I'm getting emotional. So if anybody knows where it is, I'll take it. Because I'm going to cry one of these meetings. Or one of these, you know, moments. Thank you. I've been a Christian for over 26 years. And I love it. I do. I do. I love it. You see, my background is that I was a heavy metal drummer in a band during my teenage years. I had much more hair then than I do now. I was a long-haired, hippie, drugged up, in-your-face, fighting thief that slept with too many people. And uh, I know how to go back and do that, you know? I've said it so many times, I'm no fool. <laughs> I know how to get sin. I could do it tonight. I don't want it. I want to be with my Lord. Amen. I guess I'm emotional because I really want this message to have the impact on you that it has had on me. I'm no Jonah. I promise you I'm no Jonah. That's not my character in the Bible. I'm somebody else. I know who I am. But I'm no Jonah. You might be a Jonah, so this message might be for you in that regard, but in a different way, this message is for me. I think you'll understand, at least I pray we'll understand. If God can use a donkey, he can use me, right? So, it was in South Dakota 26 years ago. I was at a mission college, and I was a brand new Christian. One night, <laughs> I, 
I was sleeping in the same room with a couple of dear friends of mine, closer at the time than they are now, David and Nathan. And they were already asleep. We'd been talking back and forth. Maybe Joshua was there too, I'm not sure. But we'd been talking back and forth about all the mysteries of God that we had learned in our short time, what, three months as being a Christian? And I remember laying there thinking, God, why do we preach about the cross? Why do we teach about the cross? I mean, I've, I've taught about the cross. I'm a hardly a Christian, and I don't even know much about it. Like, what did you do? What's that all about? So I'm laying there, I'm thinking, I'm praying, I'm just pondering. And I, I knew that they were asleep because I was awake long enough to just be there. And thinking, praying, contemplating. And I just was urged to go up out of that schoolroom, dormitory room that I was in, and walk over to the sanctuary. Nobody was awake. And if they were, you know, there was few. <clears throat> I opened the door, there's a panel of light switches on this left side, like 10 of them. And I just randomly reached over and I, I flipped one up and it was the light at the very front of the sanctuary. I was at the back and it lit up the pulpit. So, I mean, imagine being back there, coming in, turning it on and poof, one light comes on. One light. Perfect. I thought, this is awesome. I knelt down in the very back at the edge of a chair, put my head down. I said, God, what does it mean? What, is the, what does the cross mean? Like, why do I sing about it? Why do we memorize stuff about the cross? Why does the Bible teach it? What's going on? And I heard a voice that said, Jonah chapter 2. I'm like, what? <laughs> Jonah. Jonah chapter 2. So I thought, okay. I went up to the pulpit, and I knew, having been there, that many times there are Bibles under the pulpit. So I, I walked up past the pulpit on this side, reached in, grabbed a Bible, set it down, opened up to Jonah, and I read chapter 2. Now we'll get there. But first we're going to go to chapter 1. Because as a brand new Christian, I read it, and it blew my mind. Okay? I hope it will blow your mind tonight. But since then, the Lord has given me much more of an ability to see beyond the layers of just black on white. Okay? I love digging. I love finding. I love searching and, and getting that wow moment in your own personal devotions and God sends his messenger to your ear. He says, hey, you didn't know this before, but now you do. You're like, whoa, did you see that? You just want to tell everybody, right? And so we're going to start in chapter 1. I don't know how to do this. I, you know, we'll just see what God has in his mind for how to present this, but I'm going to try. I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to make it faster than I normally would, but Jonah chapter 1. Oh, by the way, if it's hard for you to find the book of Jonah, it's right next to Obadiah. Just go there and you'll find it. <laughs> it says in verse 1, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai. Now, if you've ever done any study with me online, you know that I love to talk about how the Word of God comes to us. You might know. You know, sister. I know you know. The Father will speak, and the only medi mediator between heaven and earth will hear that spoken word, and that son of the God of the universe will commission one of his angels to ascend and descend as a result of his divine and human life. And that angel will come down, revealing some secret to a prophet or to somebody like me. I am not a prophet, neither do I want to be. And that's what happened to Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. God spoke through his son, through the ministration of an angel, and here is Jonah receiving that word. It's all over the Bible, and if you've never seen that, 
please pray that God gives you the ability to see that because it's amazing. Anyways, there it is. You see the Father, the Son, and the ministration of the Holy Spirit, which are anybody who's filled with the Spirit willing to speak up on God's behalf. And Jonah, he received that word. And the word said in verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh. By the way, Jonah, do you know what that means, his name? His name means dove. Yeah, the messenger of hope, right? Do you know what Amatai means? So Jonah, the son of Amatai. Amatai actually means my truth. The dove of my truth. That's how this starts, right? The messenger of hope, because you know that little dove that flew out of Noah's ark and then came back with that leaf in his mouth. It was like, yes, something's going on. There's, there's hope out there. There's new life. There's a future. God has a plan. That's what all that means, that dove thing. Same thing with Christ, inaugurated at the baptism. God has a plan. There's hope. You know, it's all there. So the word of the Lord came to the dove of my truth. Arise, go to Nineveh. Now, what, what is Nineveh? Nineveh, it's a place built right after Babel. Did you know that? Genesis chapter 10, you can read it for yourself. Genesis chapter 10, it says that Nimrod actually helped build Babel. And then as a result of building some other cities, there was one of those guys that came out of that city and built Nineveh. Ah, so the foundation of this entire place that God was sending this dove of my truth was a very pagan place. Oh, guess what? Nineveh is what? What kind of city? Ah, oh, you're right. It's a wicked city. But I'm thinking of something else. Pagan, yes, good. Something else. Huh? Ancient. Oh, there it is. Elohim. Nineveh is an Elohim city. Did you know that? Oh, you got to study it. Study it. Look at the word Elohim. It's used for judges. It's used for Moses. It's used for Nineveh. It's used for angels. It's used for humans. Look it up. So Nineveh is an Elohim city. What it means is really powerful. There was a woman who had Elohim wrestlings. I think it was a woman. I, th I can't remember. Anyways, study it. You'll find it out really powerful. So this is a really powerful city, but with the word Elohim in our comparison today, we're going to try to understand that that means that there's a false god on the premise. Okay? Bear with me. Go back to Nineveh in your mind, Babel, false gods, right? In fact, with the whole Nineveh, uh, Babel thing, there was an uh, environmental crisis. There had been a flood, and there was going to be another something. And so they had to come together and build up a city to keep themselves from the next environmental crisis. So now, Jonah, the dove of my truth, he rose up. Oh, that's, that's where it is there, verse uh, 2. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. So did you know there are... Three cities in the Bible called that great city. Do you know what cities they are? Tell me. Babylon, Babylon Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and Nineveh. That great city. The holy city, that great city. New Jerusalem. Revelation 21. And so what you can see is there's a lot of stuff that Nineveh is that normally you don't equate it with. And jo Jonah too. Jonah is the dove of my truth. And he's being sent to Nimrod's palace, okay, built by somebody else. So Nimrod is the king doing things through his servants. You know, sounds like somebody else, right? And so then you have verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish, the opposite direction, from the presence of the Lord. 
So now Jonah rose up to go away from the presence of the Lord. Really? How can you do that? The Bible says you can't. Yeah. Whither shall I flee from thy spirit? Whither shall I go from thy presence? Jonah didn't believe. Jonah rejected truth. Okay, so let's just think about Jonah for a minute. <clears throat> he was disobedient, was he not? He was rebellious, too. Because, like, toward the end of the book, you would say, Jonah, come on. No, I'm not doing it. Okay, I'll give you a plant. Fine, I love it. Selfish. Take away the plant. Hey, give me that back. Right? Well, do something nice for somebody else. No way. He was prejudiced. Was he not? He didn't want to save the Ninevites. They had done some stuff to his family. He didn't want any part of it. Selfish. Oh, he was suicidal. Why would I say that? Yeah, he said, take up my life and throw me into the ocean. Go ahead, do it. And then later he says, I'm not even willing to live. He said that to God. In two occasions he was suicidal. He's prejudiced. He is selfish. He is rebellious. He's suicidal. Contrary to truth. He does not believe the message of God. The word of God came to him and he rejected it going the exact opposite way. You know, that's repentance. <laughs> Jonah was told to go this way and he went the exact opposite direction. He repented from God. <laughs> and so Jonah was really messed up, wasn't he? Yep. <laughs> Jonah was complete in Christ. Did you know that? What do I mean? How do I mean that? He was complete in Christ. Well, because like, watch, look, notice verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jesus, the dove of God's truth. Okay, what, is it, what do I mean? It says Jonah, not Jesus, right? I heard that in the back. Somebody said, wait a minute, it says Jonah, not Jesus. Yeah, good, no, I'm glad. I'm glad you listened. But the word of the Lord, which would be the God of heaven, came to his son named Jesus, the son of his truth, saying... Arise, my son, go to a very wicked place where there is a false god. Nimrod is the one who sends his servants out to build up his cities. Go to that great city, that very pagan city, and cry against it, my son of truth, for their wickedness is come up before me. Okay, could you see that? Could you see the father saying that to his son? All of it, every single word, except completely flipped. Why? Because Jonah is not complete by himself. He's complete in Christ. So let's continue. Jonah, in verse 3, he rose up from the throne, laid off his kingly garments, including his crown, and what did he do? He fled from the presence of the Lord. He was in the very presence of the Lord of God and he left the throne of God to come to Nineveh where you live you live in a very wicked place you know that just look outside Jesus dwelt on our soil it's amazing to me it says there in verse 3, Jesus, or Jonah, rose up to flee from the presence of the Lord. He went down. Did Jesus go down? Did Jonah go down? Yeah. Jonah went down to Joppa. There he found a ship. Did Jesus find a ship? Was he, like, ever on a ship? Okay, well, interestingly, it says here in verse 3, in the middle, Jonah paid the fare. Did Jesus ever pay a fare? He paid every single one of your debts. Everyone. Every one of our debts. Including Jonah. You know, the selfish guy that was suicidal? He was contrary. He was rebellious, selfish proud, unbelieving. Now it says, in the midst of verse 3 there, 
He went down. No, notice first. He went down to Joppa. He found a ship. He paid the fare and went down into it. Did Jesus ever take a step down? Did he take a step down? Did he take a step down? Did he keep going down and just humble himself even unto death? If you haven't seen the depths of John chapter 13, where it's talking about Jesus washing the feet, if you think he was just washing the feet, you haven't looked deep enough. That is not Jesus just washing feet. I understand we're going to have a uh, communion service here. Is that right? We need to understand a little bit more about that. Because it's not just washing feet. That goes deep. Anyways, he keeps going down. He paid the fare thereof. And... He went down with them unto Tarshish. What does it say? From the presence of the Lord. Was he, when he left Jesus, when he left heaven, did he go from the presence of the Lord? After Jesus went down and then down again, did he again leave the presence of the Lord? What did he say? My God, why have you forsaken me? I mean, Jesus did all this. No, but Jonah's different, you see, because when he, was in the sli when he was in the ship, he fell asleep. Wait a minute. When Jesus was in the ship, he fell asleep too. And you can read it right there. It says in verse 5, Then the mariners, they were afraid and cried, Every one. Unto his God. Why? Because everybody has a God around here, right? This earth, Nineveh? You kidding me? They cast forth their wares, just like it will be at the end of time. You can read it in the, the small books of the uh, end of the Old Testament. Their wares will mean nothing. They will cry unto their gods, and they're not going to save them. It says they wanted to lighten the ship, but, but Jonah was gone down. This is the third time it says Jonah went down. Jesus left the throne. He became a baby. He left his church. He left his everything. He humbled himself before the cross, then he went onto the cross. He humbled himself even unto death. I mean, this is a picture of Jesus. And it says there, that he was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep. Well, the shipmaster came to him and said, What meanest thou, O sleeper, arise, call upon your God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not? Didn't Peter say that same thing? So why are you sleeping? Rise up, we're going to die. Don't you care that we're perishing? So wait a minute, Jonah left, Jesus left. Jesus paid a fare, Jonah paid a fare. They both ended up in a ship. They both left the presence of the Lord. They both went down and down and down. It says in verse 7, They said every one of them to their fellow, Come, let us cast lots that we may know whose cause this evil is upon us. For whose cause? So they cast louts, and the lot fell upon Jesus. All the trouble in this world is because of Jesus. Go all the way back and think about it. Who was the one that caused the problem? You say Satan. Really, it was Jesus. He was the Son of God. Now somebody else had a problem with that. You see? And so Satan is the one that stirred up everything because of Jesus. He's the problem. The begotten son is the problem. Just ask Lucifer, he'll tell you. So the lot fell upon this character named Jonah. So contrary to God's will, but complete in Christ. It says there in verse 8, Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, just like they asked Jesus. 
for whose cause this evil is upon us? Like, tell us, like, why is all this stuff happening? Jesus will tell you. What is your occupation? Jesus would tell you, I came to seek and save that which is lost. Where did you come from? My kingdom is not from here. What is your country? Oh, it's a beautiful place. And of what people art thou? Well, we're, we're deity. It says there in verse 9, And he, this would be Christ or Jonah, said unto them, I am a Hebrew. I'm like the roots of the Israel nation. I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord. Was that true of Jesus? The God of heaven. Not himself. He feared the Lord, the God of heaven. Which has made the sea and the dry land. How did the God of heaven make the sea and the dry land? Through his son, through Jonah, if you will, in this story. I'm the one that serves that God. I am a Hebrew. I'll tell you where I've come from. I'll tell you what my occupation is. I'll tell you what kind of people I am as well. He would tell you any of those questions very differently than what Jonah would have said, but the same questions were asked about Jesus. It says in verse 10, Then were the men exceedingly afraid. Fear God and give glory to him. Is that what I'm hearing? And they said unto him, why have you done this? <laughs> They're asking Jesus the same thing. Why? Why are you even here? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. <laughs> Did they know that Jesus came from the presence of the Lord because he told them? He told them all day long. I have come from my Father. You want to see it? Here, look at John chapter 13. John 13, verse 1. I'll just read it because I'm getting there. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, and Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God, and was going to God, Jesus knew these things. He was telling them all the time. My Father in heaven. My Father in heaven. I'm going to my Father in heaven. Where I'm going, you cannot come now. They're like, why, well, why can't they come? Why can't we come? He says, well, you can't come now either. Talking to his disciples. He kept on telling them all the time he's going to his Father. He's going up to heaven. He was from heaven. Same thing that Jonah had been saying. It says in verse 11, Then said they unto him, this is now Jonah chapter 1, then they said unto him, What shall we do unto you, that the sea may be calm unto us? Now what was Jesus saying to Nicodemus? Lift me up, and I will draw all men unto myself. And if they come to him, what happens to the sea? It becomes calm. You have a peace that passes understanding, right? Right? So, what shall be done unto you that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea rotten was very tempestuous. And then Jonah, his answer was just as what I said in verse 12. He said, take me up. Just like Jesus said, lift me up and I will draw all men to me. And in their minds, in that sea of people, it will be calm. But this is Jonah, of course, being uh, suicidal. Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. Go ahead end my life. Do it for me. I don't have enough courage to do it for myself. But of course, in this typology, Jonah couldn't take himself up. That's why he said, take me up. You can't crucify yourself. Christ couldn't, couldn't crucify himself. He said, take up your cross and follow me, but he didn't say crucify yourself, did he? Somebody else has to do that for you. I am crucified with Christ. Because the Romans are going to kill you just like they did him. So it says in verse 12, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. 
The entire reason for the controversy is because of Jonah. The entire reason for the controversy is because of Jesus. Are you with me? Can you see the clear parallel between Jonah and Jesus? No wonder Jesus said, after they said, show us a sign. He says, I'm not going to show you any sign. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, if you're taking notes. I'm not going to show you any sign except for the sign of the one that is complete when you see him through my eyes. Jonah, complete in Christ. Now you understand the statement? It's not a question. Jonah, complete in Christ? No, it's a statement. Jonah, you can understand the bigger picture of Jonah when Christ is in the picture. Jonah, complete in Christ. And so here what you have, take me up because it's for my sake that this great tempest is upon you. Verse 13, nevertheless, the men rode hard. They didn't want to be saved that way. They didn't want to listen to Jonah. They didn't want to listen to Jesus, and so they rode hard, just like the disciples. <coughs> the disciples were in that boat before jo Jesus came walking on the water, and they were rowing with all their might all night long. They were wiped out. And then what happened? Jesus gets in the boat, and they immediately are on the shore. Remember that? That's what it says. Read it for yourself. It says in verse 13, Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring it to the land, but they could not. Jonah might be right next to you. And you might not recognize him for who he is, and you might be rowing hard, but it's not going to get you anywhere until Jesus is in the picture, until Jonah is complete in Christ. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard. They could not save themselves, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous. That's the second time, by the way, it said that, because it already said it in verse 11. So in other words, it was really, really bad. You might have a life that's really, really bad. Jonah's there with you. You just might have to wake him up. He's there with you. The disciples just had to wake him up. And that, I think, illustrates the fact that we're asleep more than he's asleep. Because my God, according to the Bible, never sleeps. You can read that. Now, Jesus is a human, of course. He needed that rest, but... I think it also illustrates a bigger picture. Verse 14, Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord. Wait a minute. Wait, they cried unto the Lord? Wait, what? I thought it said that every man was calling unto his God. Didn't it say that? It says in verse 5, The mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his Elohim. That's what it says. But now, here in verse 14, wherefore they cried unto a Lord, the Lord. And they said, we beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee. Let us not perish for this man's life. Why? Why, why would that be true for us to say about Jesus? Let us not perish for this man's life. That's right, because that one man's life was paid for us. We don't want to pay for his life. He paid for us so we don't have to. You see? That's the gospel right there in Jonah. Let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us, what kind of blood? Innocent blood. blood. You're telling me Jonah was innocent. The liar. The one who was disobedient, the rebellious one, the one that was prejudiced, selfish. That's the one, suicidal. Innocent blood, really. Or is there a bigger picture in Jonah? Jonah didn't have innocent blood. There's no way around that book. You can't find innocent blood in Jonah. So I don't know what they were thinking. Except that Jonah had a better understanding of what his message really was. And maybe Jonah didn't understand this part that I'm trying to bring out, that he actually illustrated the life of Christ. I want to talk to him when I get into heaven. Jonah, come on, man. What was that about? Innocent blood, really? He's going to say, no, 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 no. There was a layer deeper than that. Let me tell you all about it. And we're going to be like, whoa. <laughs> so it says there in verse... 
14 toward the middle. Lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. You know, Christ was offered for our sake out of the pleasure of his Father. The Bible talks about that. I don't remember the exact words. I can't, re I can't quote the thought. Maybe you can help me, but... Say again? It pleased the Father to bruise him. Thank you, Thomas. Hebrews 3, you say? Isaiah 53, thank you. Yeah, 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 there it is. It pleased the Father to bruise him. And so it was the pleasure of the Father that Jonah would give his life for the other mariners in the boat. It pleased the Father to give his Son for anybody who wants to be in the boat. It says in verse 15, so they, it says in verse 15, so they took up Jonah and they cast him forth into the sea. And the sea ceased from her raging. So everybody who believed the words of Jonah received peace. They received calm. A peace that passes understanding. Imagine the raging waters. It mentioned twice it was tempestuous. It was raging. And then all of a sudden they throw him, they pick, take him up, as it says, they took up Jonah. Now Jonah is higher than them. They killed him, cast him forth. Cast your bread upon the waters. And the sea ceased. They had a peace that they could not understand. You see that? They, how, how would they explain that? Okay, wait a minute. We took up Jonah, we threw him into the water, and now it's calm. How do you explain that? A peace that passes understanding. It says in verse 16, Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. It was reformation. And they offered a sacrifice unto a God, unto the Lord. And they made vows. They literally committed their lives to God. As a result of Jonah. <laughs> Jonah! Remember Jonah? Jonah is like the worst possible specimen that could be found to represent Jesus for the Nicolaites. Like, God, can't you find somebody else? Somebody who believes? Somebody who cares? Somebody who doesn't go the other direction? Somebody who actually knows that you are with them at all times? You know everything. He's not selfish. He's not prejudiced. Couldn't you find somebody else? No, no, no. God wanted to use Jonah. God wanted to use Jonah to give people like me hope. I'm not a Jonah because I haven't turned away from God's voice. When he called me, I went, and I went fast. I went as fast as I can go, and I keep on going, and I don't want to stop. But just like you, my life's a wreck. You want to hear about my background? I told you about my background. I don't even tell some of the stuff that I went through because it's too shameful. And God can use me to represent his son. And it doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter if you've been suicidal like I have. I was suicidal as a pastor, friends. I was ready to kill myself as a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. I have done the deeds contrary to God's law, shamefully. But God has called me, and I'm willing to be that representative. What about you? Doesn't matter where you've been. Doesn't matter where you've been. Look at Jonah. He was a wreck. <laughs> and I can't tell you yet how God used him so amazingly to represent his son when he was so contrary to God's will. I don't know how to explain that, but it's true. Do you know Jesus told the story of the unjust judge to represent his father? Do you know that? The unjust judge. What is a judge supposed to be? 
He was exactly what he shouldn't be. He was the unjust judge. And he's, he told that story to represent his father. He's telling you the story of Jonah to represent his son when he's an unjust judge. He's a not-for-profit prophet. <laughs> if you understand what I'm saying. Excuse me. So it says there in verse 17, Jonah chapter 1 now, the Lord, the God of heaven, had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. The only sign I'm going to give you, let's read it. Matthew chapter 12. Keep your finger there. Matthew chapter 12. And it says in verse 38, Certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. And he answered and said unto them, An Elohim nation, one that Nimrod built, or the agents of Nimrod. An evil and adulterous Nimrod, or Nineveh-type generation, seeks after a sign. And there shall no sign be given it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. He called him a prophet. Are you kidding me? He can call somebody like me a son? Somebody like you a son or a daughter? Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't matter what kind of background you have. He can use you. And he wants to. It's so amazing. God doesn't need us, but he wants us. There's a song like that. It blows my mind every time I hear it. <laughs> so it says there, there's no, going to be no sign given unto you, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. Verse 40, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, Oh, sorry. Yeah, in the heart of the earth. Wait, did I miss something? Yeah. Yeah. Verse 40. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus, what do you mean? Well, I'll tell you partly what he means. There's... Uh, Where is it? That other part. Oh, yeah. Matthew chapter 12, real quick, talks about David at the beginning. David was a who? He was a, he was a king, but, oh, sorry, he talks about the priests in the temple. Sorry, my bad. Priests in the temple in verse 5. Then he talks about the prophet in verse 39. Then he talks about Solomon, the king, in verse 42. Why? Because Jesus, in chapter 12 of Matthew, is trying to help them understand he is not only the priest, he is the prophet and the king. Check that out in Matthew chapter 12. It's pretty powerful. So what you have here in Jonah, going back there, we have this idea that Jesus is being illustrated by Jonah in this great fish to be swallowed up. And it says there in verse 17 toward the end, Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, why did Jesus say there's going to be no sign given unto you except the prophet Jonah? Because Jesus understood that the entire message, the entire book of Jonah, illustrated his life. So contrarily, if that's a word. Because Jonah was not... As far as I can tell, written on paper, Jonah was not a Christian. Not the kind that I would want to hang out with. Hey, man, you want to sing, like, scripture songs together? No, sir. Going, going this way. Hey, man, you want to go witness together? No way. I don't, I don't like those people. Hey, man, would you give me a little of that shade? Nope. That's mine. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to hang out with Jonah. But Jesus called him a prophet. Because this story, flipped on its head, shows us that Jonah 
is complete in Christ. Because without the story of Christ, how would you say, stamped on the top of Jonah, we can't understand that book. It's just a crazy prophet. It was thrown into a fish. And then there was like this radical reformation, which you can apply to Pentecost, by the way. I won't get there tonight, but that's how to go there in chapter 3 and onward. But so in verse 2, this is, this is where I was standing at the pulpit. I opened up my Bible to Jonah chapter 2, and I started reading. And I'll tell you, God spoke to me that night. He showed me. Jonah represents Jesus. Like, I asked God that night, what is the cross? What is that all about? He said, he sent me to Jonah, chapter 2. Really? I, I've never been the same. I told him, I told people the next day, man, you got to see Jonah. You got to see Jonah. Look at Jonah, chapter 2. They're like, dude, we got to go to Sabbath school. It was Friday night. I'm like, I know we got to go to Sabbath school. You don't got time for Jonah. No, we got time for Jonah. I got to put on my tie. Are you serious? Come on, man, look at Jonah. And nobody would hear me out that day. Like, few would even give me the time. I was so excited about Jonah. And they weren't picking up what I was throwing down. I didn't care. I was telling everybody anyways. The very first sermon I ever preached in the Seventh-day Adventist Church was this chapter. I called it the first sermon God preached to me. And guess who was in that audience? <sighs> My father. An alcoholic as long as I could know. Three months before he died, he called me and wanted me to baptize him. Yeah. He died 12 hours before I would have baptized him. But I believe that he's going to be there. And I'm not just saying that because he's my dad. He had a heart for God. I believe it. I really do. He was thorny as a rose bush. But he wanted to know. Like Jonah. Anyways, in verse 1 of chapter 2, just like Jesus, Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. Now, I can't go into all the details, but I'm just going to say it for you, okay? When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane walking with his disciples, and he started getting heavy, and he needed their help, and he said, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even to death. That's when he entered into the fish. That's when he entered into this Jonah experience. It was Thursday night, and it was three days and three nights that he was in the belly of the earth. The earth represents you, friends, and it was your sin that was upon my Savior. And that's when he entered in. And I'll tell you, he was three days and three nights there, and it was forever for him, just like it was forever for Jonah. He didn't know how long he was there. It was three days and three nights, but you couldn't ask Jonah after he got out, how long were you there? All three days and three nights. It was like, no problem. It says, you'll read it. He was there forever. He didn't know. Jesus was in that fish, and he couldn't see past the portals of the tomb. For you! And for all those sinners out there that don't know, every single one of them, it doesn't matter their past, this is the gospel, friends. It's in the book of Jonah. Doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, God can use you. It says there in verse 2. Oh, by the way, Jesus cried out in the fish's belly. It was in Matthew chapter 26. And Jesus said, My God, my Father, my Father, if this cup could pass from me, please. Make it happen. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You've heard him say that. You've read it a thousand times. Did you know it was Jonah that was saying that first? It says in verse 2. Well, maybe David said it before him, but anyways. And Jonah, Jesus cried, by reason of his affliction, he cried unto the Lord. And it says, he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried Jesus, and God the Father heard his voice. Can you see it? It says in verse 3. Now think about this for a minute. There's a guy in history called William Beebe. I don't know. Anybody know about William Beebe? 
Oh, I thought you raised your hand. I was going to say you're the second person I've ever met. <laughs> he went the deepest into the ocean than anybody had ever gone before with a copper suit. Hmm. Okay? And the pressures of the weight of the water around him made him very fearful. He wrote it out. He was extremely afraid. Because if one portion of the glass in front of his face would have cracked or broken, the shards of that glass would have pierced through his skull like a shotgun. He just would have been completely consumed because of the weight of the water around him. Let's go now to verse 3. You have cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, that's two, and the floods, that's three, compassed me about. All thy billows, that's four, and thy waves, that's five, have passed over me. Five different ways Jonah tried to express the potency of the water around him. Can you feel it? The deep, the seas, the floods, the billows, and the waves. He cannot express more. Like when God says something one time, he means it. When he says it twice, you better listen. Here, Jonah says five different ways he's talking about the same thing, water. Can you imagine Jesus in the midst of your sin? He just feels like he's going to be crushed, absolutely crushed. And if there was one fracture in his character, it would have completely imploded him. He would have been gone forever. The risk of eternal loss. It says there in verse 5, sorry, verse 4. Then Jesus said, I am cast out of your sight. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yet he was struggling like Jonah was. I will look again toward thy holy temple. He couldn't see past the portals of the tomb. I know that, but somehow this story says that he had some kind of faith. He was unwilling to give up. He was struggling. Your Savior was struggling like Jonah was struggling. It says there in verse 4 again, I said, I, will, I am cast out of your sight. My God, my God, my way have you taken me. I will, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. It says, the waters compassed me about, Jesus said, even to the soul. My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. The depth closed me round about. Now, he's adding to the deep, the floods, the seas, the billows, and the waves. Now you have water and depth again. So that's seven different ways waters have been referred to. What do you think seven could represent? Jesus was completely crushed by the weight of sin. That's why he couldn't see past the portals of the tomb. Because of what I have done. Verse 5, the waters compassed me about even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. Jonah said the weeds were what? Did Jesus have anything like that? Jesus had weeds wrapped around his head too. Verse 6, I went down. He's already gone down three times in the book of Jonah. But now he's going down again. This is the fourth time Jonah has gone down. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. What mountains? The mountains that we look up to? The mountains that are under the ocean. I went down to the bottoms of the ocean. Do you know the highest mountain in the world is under the water? <laughs> Did you know that? Yeah. He went down as far as you could go. Jesus did. As far as you could go. You know when he was walking on the road to Emmaus, and it's, 
that road is actually going down in elevation. And it says, Jesus would have continued, but they bade him to come with them. Remember that? When it says, Jesus would have continued, he would have continued going down because he is so willing to go wherever you have gone and even further. He loves you. Somebody called me today. They haven't been, in the last three days, they haven't been reading their Bible because their mother, her mother said something to her that really, really, really offended her. I said, with all the passion I could muster, dear sister, God loves you. You know that? I said, do you know that he loves you so much? He actually sent his son, like for you. I said, if your family's going to hell, don't neglect God and go to hell with them. And she started crying. She couldn't hold it. That was it. She knew that she was going the wrong direction. She gave up reading. She gave up trusting in God. She gave up the mercy of God extended to her because her mother had made her mad. Really? How shameful that the devil will make you do something so stupid. You're going to hell with those that are offensive because you are offended? No. No, no, no. Step up, friends. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. It doesn't matter what they've done to you. Don't, don't hold that grudge and go to hell with them. Jesus will go all the way down, all the way down. It says it right there. It says in verse 6, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me how long? No, 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 no. It's only three days and three nights, Jonah. Don't you get it? No, no, no. He couldn't see past the portals of the tomb. You can see it right there. The bars were about me forever. I couldn't see. I couldn't see. Jesus didn't know for you and for me. Oh, I wish we could get it. I wish I understood more. I can see it, but I just wish I could get it more. There's more. I know there is. And it says here in verse 6 again, toward the middle, the earth with her bars was about me forever, yet thou hast brought my life up from corruption. O oh Lord, my God. What does that mean? Where was Jesus at this point? Where? He was risen from the dead. You have brought up my life from corruption. Wait a minute. Acts chapter 2 says that he would not see corruption. There's a conflict there. I don't fully understand that yet, but I'm, I'm still learning. Maybe you've got some insight and you can share it with me, but that's what the Bible says. You have brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. Verse 7, when my soul fainted within me, when it happened that Jesus was ready to faint, completely go down, I remembered the Lord. That's why Jesus said, my God, no, sorry, my Father, into thy hands, I commit my spirit. Because when, it says right there, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. That's past tense, by the way. That's after he's resurrected. He can look back and say that. My prayer came in unto thee, into thy holy temple. Which is where? In heaven. And you know how prayers get up to heaven, don't you? Amen. Amen. It says, verse 8, They that observe lying vanities, which in this case would be anybody who rejected Christ, I would say the Pharisees, the Sadducees, etc. They that observe lying vanities have forsaken their own mercy. Who was their mercy? Christ. And did they forsake him? Yes. Now, they observed lying vanities. What, what, could, what could that mean? Matthew chapter 15, verse 8 will tell you. In vain... Do they worship me? Teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. Do we have anybody that does that today? 
Of course. They forsake their own mercy. But, verse 9, I will sacrifice unto you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Now we're going back to the counsel between them both. You see, because the father, he had asked the son, are you willing to do this? Three times the son went in before the father. You remember all that, right? I will pay that that I have vowed. Jesus was willing to do it for you, for your son, for your daughter, for your mother, your everybody, anybody, your neighbor. It says there in verse nine, uh, 9 again, I'll read it. I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that which I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Now, if Jesus is speaking, who's he talking about? Salvation is of his Father. Because listen, if Christ isn't risen from the dead, you have how much hope? None, according to 1 Corinthians 15. And guess what? Who raised his son from the dead? The Father, exactly. And so salvation is of my Father. So in verse 10, the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited Jonah upon the dry land. Jonah came out alive. Guess who else came out alive? Jesus came out alive. Why this is so emotional to me is just because I want the gospel to go to the Gentiles. I really do. But I, I know a lot of people, and our lives are a mess. We're a wreck. I mean, think about yourself or maybe your neighbor. You, maybe that fellow Christian that thinks they're a Christian, but they're really not. They're a wreck. And God wants to use people like us that are wrecks. You've got an ugly background. You've done that stuff. You've been there. But God can still use you to spread the gospel of his son, Jesus Christ, through a life like yours. Don't think for a moment he can't do it, because he can. Doesn't matter what happened. God can use you. And I want to be used, don't you? I really want to bring many sons unto glory. I want to be one of those tools that God uses to bring people to himself. So I want to pray for you. Will you pray for me? That God will use the wreck of our life and bring glory to his name. Think about Jonah and think about the gospel. Don't let anybody think they can't be used of God. If Jonah can be used, you can be used. Amen? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I want to thank you that you've given us this opportunity to learn a little bit more from the book of Jonah and, and how it illustrates the life of your precious son. I pray that you would help us to realize that in our little lives, there's nobody else you want to use compared to us. Just like in Jonah's little life, there was nobody else you wanted to use but him. You should have used somebody else. But you used him. And sometimes I feel like you could use somebody other than me, but you want to use me. And Father, I want to thank you that every single one of us can have that special treasure feeling that we're yours and you want to use us to do one of the greatest works on the face of the planet to represent you before this world. Lord, we want it. I want it. I want to be a vessel in your hand. I want to be one of those sharp threshing instruments. I want to bring many sons unto glory. I want to be one of those that lightens the earth with your glory. I want to be one of those messengers going from house to house with my face lightened. I want to be blessed and I want to have you receive all the praise through your son. So Lord, please help us Help us all to do your bidding better than Jonah.
Help us to do it with a willing heart. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.